The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. And here I thought yesterday's podcast about magic bands was funny. Oh, the world just keeps one-upping itself, doesn't it? We've got magic rings now. Magic bands, magic rings. At this point, any damn thing to get a basketball game going. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Happy weekend. Whenever you happen to be listening to this podcast, this is Fantasy NBA Today. A hoop ball presentation. Hoop-ball.com is the website. I am your host, Dan Vespris. At Dan Bespris on Twitter, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. Reminder, everybody, once again, to check out HoopBall's recently revamped and restarted Instagram page, HoopBall Official. I believe the kids say at HoopBall Official on Instagram. Just a handful of followers so far, just getting going over there. Guy's doing a wonderful job of getting that thing rolling with some pretty cool graphics. Should be a lot of fun. Really, it's an area for discussion more than anything else. And, of course, the HoopBall Facebook page, which has been floating around for a while now, but uh, Lyle really doing a nice job of getting that thing back alive again. Devin also working on the Facebook page. Saturday night, Lyle, live show with the Fantasy Pro every week on Saturdays over at the HoopBall Facebook page. That's the only place you can get that bad boy. Shout out to the guys over at Hoopball Clippers and uh, Hoopball Pelicans and Hoopball Lakers, all three of whom had a show out yesterday, late last night. Hoopball Clippers and Hoopball Lakers, actually a crossover episode. Ethan and Brandon doing a show together, and Lyle handling the Hoopball Pelicans podcast with guest Mason Ginsburg. Great stuff. Those are at Hoopball Lakers, at Hoopball Clips, and at Hoopball Pels on Twitter if you want to follow those feeds. And then, of course, the shows are really easy to find. They're just the Hoopball New Orleans Pelicans podcast, Hoopball, LA Clippers podcast, you get it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these magic rings, and then we'll segue into some fantasy stuff today. Um, I didn't read the full text of the article on how these rings work at a nano level, but apparently the rings are uh, from a company named Aura, O-U-R-A, and by wearing them... It can track a player's body temperature, heart rate, resting or uh, oxygen levels. And from that data, and I, I'm assuming a little bit of other stuff, it can actually let a player know if they're showing symptoms of illness. And of course, the one that they're paying most attention to would be COVID. But obviously, if someone's showing symptoms that are irregular, meaning that, you know, heart rate is the wrong, the wrong target number, I, I assume the players are not going to be wearing these when they're actually running around on the basketball court because your heart rate's going to be going uh, a little bit faster when they're sprinting up and down the floor. But, you know, if they're sitting in their hotel room and all of a sudden their resting oxygen level starts to dip, that might be a time that they want to pay attention to it. My fear with something like these rings is that I've, I'm not personally in the medical field, but I am connected to... A host of people that are. My wife is a doctor. My uncle's a doctor. My cousin's a doctor. Actually, two of them. My aunt is an ER nurse. Uh, it, it's <laughs> a little bit stereotypical, I know. Uh, but I grew up in a in a medical household and a medical family, and they're basically all here with me in LA. So it's not like these are people that I don't see or talk to, except now during the pandemic, you don't see or talk to anybody. But so I, you know, kind of growing up around medicine. You, you learn more than you want to, and now still being around it, given that, and again, my spouse is a doctor, you sort of know that little things like this, they tend to set off more alarms rather than fewer. Meaning, what if the ring isn't properly contacting part of the skin? It could buzz because it's not picking up a heart rate or the right oxygen level. In fact, and some of you... Folks out there with with kids or have had kids in the past, you've probably heard of a device called the Owlet, which is a a sleep sack, basically. It's a something that you can put on an infant when they're asleep that tracks to make sure that they're breathing. And they, all these types of devices, they ring when anything goes wrong. 
Now, I get it. For this particular scenario, it makes sense to be overly cautious, right? So, like, a player sitting in his hotel room or he's playing ping pong or whatever the hell they're doing uh, with the 900 activities they've got planned out for these guys, and they're wearing their ring, and it starts to buzz. They're going to get it checked out. I don't know if they're, they got to go see, like, the, the physician on site or whatever it is. Maybe they get their, they, they get a test, an additional test. These guys are getting tested every single day, but presumably the ring can pick it up before an actual COVID test that requires viral load can. So I don't know what the exact plan is here. If, if the ring buzzes, does a player immediately go into quarantine? I feel like we're going to be putting guys into quarantine for all kinds of wrong reasons. So we don't have this success rate, but let's say that it's even 80%. Let's say 80% of the time it goes off, it's actually picking up a COVID case. And it doesn't really miss much, right? Like if every player is wearing it and it's going to buzz more often than less often, it might, you know, let's say it only misses like one out of every 20 or something like that. That's probably still a positive, even though, and believe me, the players are going to be pissed about that 20% where it buzzes and they don't actually have COVID because... What if that player has to go into isolation for two days and to see if any symptoms emerge or to wait to see if the test comes back positive? So we'll see how this whole thing plays out. We'll see how the ring is utilized. But at this point, if we want NBA, we do, by the way. Spoiler alert, we do. If we want NBA, and if they, they being the league, the players, the staff, the coaches, the GMs, whatever, if they want the league, then we're all going to have to be okay with annoyances. Some of them bigger than others. So if this ring buzzes on someone and it says, we think you have COVID, and they have to go sit in the ISO tank for a day and a half, and then it turns out that they didn't have it, that player's going to be pissed, and that team is going to be pissed. But at the end of the day... If we want to make it through these eight games and the playoffs without a massive COVID outbreak, we have to take every precaution, including probably benching some people and ISOing some people that don't actually have it. It's important to be more cautious in this particular case. Also, by the way, as I'm saying this right now, I don't know how we haven't seen more Joe Johnson jokes related to players... Uh, having to go into isolation in Orlando. I know he's not in the NBA anymore, but the dude has the nickname Iso Joe. He'd be fantastic for this. <laughs> That's stupid. Uh, we laugh so we don't cry. Um, okay, so magic rings, magic bands. That's what's happening here when uh, the NBA gets going again. We'll we continue to wait and see. Kendrick Perkins and Kyrie Irving are beefing. Just another day. COVID cases are very high in the Orlando area. Um, I don't know if that's going to play an impact on anything. It's also still, by the way, countdown, 41 days away from the NBA coming back. So if they actually take measures and try to knock some of that stuff down, they should be okay. And the Disney campus is some 25-ish miles, I think, away from the main part of Orlando. Where is it? Is that Kissimmee? Am I getting that right? It's its own little bubble. That's the point. The issue is people coming in, where do they work who are coming in to service this NBA bubble? So that's going to be where you need to be very, very cautious. Yesterday, we talked about uh, resumption leagues, and I would suggest we all get in them because at this point, this is our only shot to play fantasy NBA for what would eventually be eight or nine months. If someone during a normal offseason, which for fantasy folks runs from April through basically September, because in September we go full bore into draft prep, and oftentimes even a little bit earlier than that. If someone in that April-September window said to me, Dan, would you want an eight-game NBA season in July? I'd probably say no. I'd probably say no because... We've been going so hard for 180 regular season days plus a month, month and a half before that to draft. So, you know, we've been we've been crushing it for like 230 straight days. 
my brain says, no, take some time off. Do your couple months of postmortems. Do your free agency stuff. Do your draft prep, and then you're ready for the next one. But this is different. This is March to December between regular, regular seasons. So this is our only opportunity to actually play a little bit of fantasy basketball for nine months. That's pretty different than five to six. An extra an extra season of temperatures out there. So I think we should all get into them. Uh, I have on good authority from our good buddy, friend of the show, Adam King, that Fantrax will be putting out some resumption leagues here in the not-too-distant future. And when they do... Let's get involved in them. And as we talked about on yesterday's podcast, two of the main things you need to be looking at when you're drafting for these particular leagues is, number one, uh, who's actually going to play, right? We talked about, and and that was really the, the big one. We talked about league settings as kind of the little side note on yesterday's podcast, but the main one was instead of trying to figure out what guys are going to do when they're on the floor. We know that already because we know every single team's situation from 65 regular season games coming into this resumption. We know what everybody does when they're on the floor. Question is, when will they be on the floor? That's where we left off on yesterday's podcast. So today, and into our weekend show, I thought it'd be kind of fun because, you know, weekend shows tend to hang out there in the internet ether for longer than our uh, regular, our Monday through Thursday shows, which get supplanted by the very next one the very next day, is to start going through team by team of the 22 teams that are still in action, do we feel good or bad about the players on those teams, how much they're actually going to be playing, and what adjustments you make to them if you are in your draft. I thought about doing this from a divisional standpoint and like go uh division by division but that's not that doesn't really work um different divisions have different numbers of players that are actually involved in the resumption you know for instance the uh pacific has four teams that are in there because the suns made it warriors the only one that that didn't make it out of that conference uh the timberwolves are the only team in the northwest that didn't make it Every team in the Southwest division is in the bubble. So, I, you know, we could have gone that way. But, I don't know. Just with teams missing, and especially once we got to the Eastern Conference when uh, the, the Hornets, the Bulls, the Knicks, the Pistons, the Hawks, the Cavs, all those teams are not coming back. It gets a little bit a little bit lopsided. And you're talking about, you know, like a Central Division that only has, what, three teams that are in the thing. And, uh, no, two. Yeah, just two, Milwaukee and Indiana. So that that method got ruled out, summarily executed, and I decided we're just going to go by record in each conference. So today we'll start in the Western Conference. You guys know I like to move west to east across the United States because, well, crap, I live in the western side of the United States, so that's where we start, and we'll work our way down the records, starting at the top with the Lakers, discussing what each team is looking at during this eight-game resumption, what players may see a boost or a knock as a result of what their team is looking at. And uh, we'll get through, I don't know, there's 22 teams that have come back, try to knock this out in the next two to three shows. And if we run a little bit long, we'll do it in four. Today, we start with the Lakers. And before we start with the Lakers, I want to remind everybody once again... We are recruiting for DFS. If you're a daily fantasy head, I'm not. You guys have figured that out, I'm sure. Hit me on Twitter, at Dan Bespris. Or you can hit the marvelous Mike Apatria. Mike, A-P-O-T-R-I-A, Apatria. He is running the DFS Today podcast as it comes back to hoopball here in the next couple of weeks. So hit him up or hit me up on Twitter or send an email to teamhoopball at hoop-ball.com. If you're into DFS and you think you can talk or write about it here at Hoopball, this is a great time to hit us up. Right before things pick up again. Don't wait. If we get too close to the season, we're going to run out of time to talk to you guys. Right now, we still have a few minutes. 
So bug us. Bug us. What are you waiting for? Stop waiting. Come bug us. Okay, the Lakers. And this one is, by all accounts, a relatively easy place to start because, and as we hinted at on yesterday's show, I think we were talking about Anthony Davis, the Lakers have a big lead. They're 49-14. and 14. They're the one seed in the Western Conference, and they're five and a half games up on anybody else. The Clippers are the number two seed in the Western Conference. Well, five and a half games up means it's freaking hard to try to pass them. And everybody's like, well, what does the loss column mean? It means a lot, actually, in this one, because the Lakers and the Clippers are actually separated by six losses, and it's relevant because the teams are not going to end up playing the same number of games this year. The Clippers have played 64 games. The Lakers have played but 63. So when this is all over, the Lakers will be at 71. The Clippers will be at 72. And that extra game right now is a loss. It's a five and a half game lead for the Lakers, but a six game separator in the loss column, five in the win column. So the Clippers have to make that extra jump. Does anybody here think the Lakers really lose six of their eight games? The Clippers can't afford to just gain five and a half games on the Lakers. They have to gain a full six because, again, the number of games played for these teams is not going to even out at the end. Thus, you're looking at a situation where, and we don't have the schedule for these teams yet, but they're, you know, they're only playing the other 21 teams that are involved with them. If the Lakers win two games, they lock up the one seed. It's as simple as that. They're then at 51 wins and 14 losses on the season at that point. And even if the Clippers won all eight games, and then the Lakers lost their, what, remaining six? Am I getting this right? No, excuse me. They'd have to win three. Sorry, guys. I'm an idiot. It's Friday. I'm tired. Lakers just have to win three games. If they win two, the Clippers could still pass them because there's a six-game jump. Yeah, clearly, Dan, you're a moron. Uh, if the Lakers win their first three games, it's done. Because the worst they could go at that point is 52 and, and 19, and the best the Clippers can get to is 52 and 20. That is their max out point. So there's a very real world here. I don't know that the Lakers will win their first three games of this resumption, but if they do... None of their other games mean anything. I don't think they're catching the Bucks. Lakers are four games back in Milwaukee for the best record overall in the NBA. Excuse me, three games back in Milwaukee. So I don't think they're catching them in this resumption. Although Milwaukee, similarly to the Lakers, will likely be coasting for at least the last three of these games. So what does this mean generally then? What it means is that if the Lakers win three games in a row to start the resumption, you'll probably see five games where Anthony Davis and LeBron only play half the ball game, if that. They'll probably get a game off in there if they lock it up quickly. Especially because you minimize COVID and injury risk that way. I know you want them all tuned up, tuned up and certainly having all eight games to actually get your legs underneath you and kind of remind yourself of team chemistry is important. That's the only reason I think they'd even play half the game. They'll do their rotations. They'll get them in order. But you're talking about, and I mean, let's let's say conservatively, the Lakers take five games to win three. They go three and two. You're still looking at three games at the end of this resumption where their guys are not going to be playing the normal minutes. And that means, as we saw earlier this year, when Anthony Davis sits an entire ball game, JaVale McGee and Dwight Howard both became hugely relevant fantasy players. When LeBron sat out, actually it was Rajon Rondo that saw one of the biggest jumps, but I don't, yuck, I don't even think I can, I don't think I can recommend that even in this scenario, but maybe, 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 maybe. If he's playing like 35 minutes with LeBron out and with his horrible percentages, he could still triple-double. Seems like just the kind of game, a meaningless resumption game where Rondo would get you like 14, 14, and 11. So there are three very distinct backups on this Lakers team that 
and I don't know if your leagues are going to allow pickups and drops. I, I would assume so if it's a points or roto format. Why not allow pickups and drops? I would try to get out in front of that curve, and I'm probably drafting JaVale McGee with the expectation that I can use two or three of his probable starts. I mean, he was starting anyway, but his minutes, instead of being 17, will be more like 24 or 25. And he's a great fantasy player if he gets into the mid-20s. We hinted at this on yesterday's podcast. What does it mean for guys like Anthony Davis and LeBron James? Well, I think you kind of have to jump over them. I don't think you draft Anthony Davis with a top two or three pick because there's a very real chance that he only plays half of this resumption, basically. Three full games and like five partial games. A little bit more than half if you're looking at the, the total accruing that he could be doing there. Same thing for LeBron. I just don't see a planet where those guys play 34, 35 minutes all eight games. Danny Green, not interested. KCP, not interested. I mean, I'm sure he'll do a little bit more if LeBron sits some games out. But the guys you're looking at here, unfortunately, are Rondo, and I don't think I would draft him. I think I'd rather wait and see on that front. But JaVale you got to put him on your list of guys that could slot in because he was top 150 over the entire regular season anyway. But if you look at the games that Anthony Davis missed, he was a monster. He was a beast in those games, and it was great. And he was on and off of fantasy teams throughout the year, and rightfully so because when the Lakers were healthy, McGee wasn't doing enough to be on a fantasy roster. But when AD was out, that changed everything. You can look at McGee's fantasy numbers from this year and just look at the games where he cleared 20 minutes. That's all you need to do if you want to see what he's capable of. Early in the season, he had a 29-minute game uh, against Memphis where he went for 10-9 and nine with a block. And by all accounts, that was actually a fairly slow game. Uh, a couple weeks later in Golden State, he went for 18-17 and 17 with three steals and three blocks in 27 minutes. 23-minute game against the Thunder on November 19th. 8.6 boards, 4 blocks. This is game-changing stuff. Because if he gets 3 or 4 games in a row to just go nuts, we saw what he could do early last year. Remember pre-pneumonia, JaVale McGee last season? This is an 8-game roto season, and JaVale McGee in 4 starts could get you 15 blocks. 15 blocks in a roto format, if that's really what you're looking at, that could almost win the league for you. 14 blocks would be the difference between like 10th place and 2nd place in your roto league. Because this is such a small sample size. We're talking 8 games at every roster slot. You're talking a total of 80 games played. Think about it from this perspective. We'll, we'll do the math side. The average number of blocks you need to be kind of middle of the pack in your fantasy league is somewhere between 0.6 and 0.7 per player in a, in a 12-team league. Sorry, you got to list that. Obviously, it's lower if your league is bigger. It's, it's higher if your league is smaller. Most of the teams that were winning blocks in 12-team Roto Leagues this year had teams that were blocking about 0.72 or 0.73 blocks per game used. So if you say 80 and you take 0.73, so about 73% of a block per game, you're talking about a total of 58 blocks. You could win your league. Well, you could win blocks in your Roto League with 58 blocks. And you're telling me, that you don't have a spot at the end of your bench to stash JaVale McGee if he gets four starts and gets you 13, 14 blocks? Game-changing. So I guess the other side of this is, is it really, do we have to take the extremely polar approach of just not drafting Anthony Davis or LeBron James? The answer to that is sort of a soft no. But I say that because it's the, it's the same way we approach it during a normal draft. 
there's no almost no one in a normal fantasy draft that we just won't draft. Okay, that's that's not a fair assessment. There's plenty of guys in a normal draft that we just won't take. But, you know, we're talking about uh, the top 50 or top 60 guys who pretty much get drafted in every single fantasy league, right? The guys that are going to end up on 100% of rosters. We say, oh, well, we're never going to draft that guy. What we mean when we say that, that's shorthand for they're never going to fall far enough for us to end up with them. But it's easier to just say, we're not drafting that guy. Uh, but it's inaccurate. So when we talk about somebody like an Anthony Davis or a LeBron James here for a resumption, where they may only play in four of the eight games, or they may only play starters minutes, I should say, in four of the eight games, we're not just not going to draft them, but we need to see where they're going to end up. If AD's really still going in the top two or three I don't think you can take him there. If LeBron's still going around 11, where he was finishing the regular season in March in a nine-category format, by averages, we probably can't take him there either. You have to demote these guys. You have to treat them. And you can do the math pretty easily, because a normal regular season is 82 games. This resumption is eight. It's basically 10% of a regular season. So if somebody misses one game... It's like them playing in 72 games of a regular season. If they miss two games, it's like them playing in 62 games of a regular season. Just do that. It's fuzzy math, but it mostly works. What happens? I mean, he, look, this is this is a pretty easy discussion to have. Look at last year where we have an entire full season of stats to work with. Look at someone near the top, like an Anthony Davis, who was number two by averages last year but missed 25% of the regular season. More, actually. He missed 26 of the 82 games last year. That's more than 25%. That's, uh, blah, blah, what is that? That's like around 30. 31.7, says the calculator. That's 31.7% of the season last year. So that's like missing somewhere between two and three games of this resumption. All right, put that in your head. That's... What if Anthony Davis plays in five or six out of the eight games of this resumption, and he was going to be the number one or number two player if he played in all of them? What does that do to his totals value? Well, last year, he was two by average. He was 11 by totals. So that's what I'm saying. We're not never drafting Anthony Davis, but if you think he's going to miss three games of this resumption, which again is basically like playing in 52 out of 82 games of a regular season, well, he shouldn't be a first-round pick anymore. Does any of us think Anthony Davis is actually going to fall outside the first round? No way. No way. What about guys in that 10-11 range that missed two or three games? Well, Joel Embiid is, uh, is probably the closest example we can use from last year. He played in 64 games, and he was number 10 by averages. And he was number 18 by totals. And that's missing about just a little less than two out of the eight games of our resumption. So should LeBron James be a first-round pick? No. In fact, you're probably looking at mid to late second. Do any of us think he's really going to fall that far? No. So that's why we say we're not drafting these guys. It's not because we're not ever going to draft them. It's because they're not going to fall as far as we would need them to if we assume they're not going to be playing in two or three of the games or playing partial minutes in three or four of them. Simple enough. Uh, I realized that just the Lakers there took like 15 minutes. So this process might take longer than I realized. So the, buckle up, everybody. This might be more like a week or a week and a half long adventure. Uh, team number two. We'll do the Clippers and we'll see how long the pod is at that point. This is the beauty of planning it out and then not knowing how long certain segments are going to take. The Clippers, 44 and 20. They're a different beast because they're a game and a half up on the Nuggets. They actually have a team breathing down their necks. On top of that, and this I think is worth mentioning, both the Clippers and the Nuggets far better at home than they are on the road. 
Right now, the Clippers would play the Mavericks in the first round of the playoffs, the Nuggets in the second round. Right now, the Nuggets would play the Rockets in the first round of the playoffs, and then, of course, the Clippers in the second round. Both of those teams, I think, are thinking more about the second round of the playoffs than the first, which could end up biting them in the butt, actually. Clippers, uh, Mavericks are no slouches when they're healthy. Rockets are a a weird team that can kind of catch you napping a little bit. I, I mean, I know the Nuggets, by record, are better, but two and a half games, even though that separates, what, three, four, five seeds in the Western Conference, those teams are not that different. Also, those teams uh, far better at home than on the road. There's a couple teams in the West that are pretty much the same. Lakers actually better on the road than they were at home this year, but again, not really relevant for our fantasy discussion. All right, so back to the Clippers. 44 and 20. 25 and 7 at home, one of the best home records in the NBA, 19 and 13, fairly pedestrian on the road for a team as good as they are or should be. 19 and 13? I mean, that's not. Jazz have a better road record. Mavericks have a better road record. It's good, right? Not that many teams are good on the road. They're good enough. But you got to think that. In the Clippers' minds, and it's funny too because when you when you think about the Clippers quickly, and you're like, oh, Kawhi Leonard, NBA champion, Paul George, two superstars, veterans, Doc Rivers, uh, head coach. This team feels like a team built to win both at home and on the road, and it just hasn't, for whatever reason, panned out that way this year. They're six games better at home than they are on the road. It's not 76ers range goofiness, but... It's substantial. I would have thought coming into the season, Clippers, Lakers, Bucks, these are the teams that should have been same at home on the road. Teams that have that championship pedigree, veterans, defense, and yet it didn't really turn out that way. Okay, but is it really going to define what the Clippers do during these final eight games? Do they care that much about staying in front of Denver and maintaining home court through at least the first two rounds of the playoffs? I think the answer to that is sort of, which is kind of a cop-out of an answer. But what it means is that you're probably going to see Kawhi Leonard take a rest day just because he's Kawhi Leonard. You're probably going to see Paul George take a rest day because of the kind of season he's been through And after a long downtime, I don't think they want to risk either one of those guys getting dinged up again. But I don't think, and this could change, right, if Denver loses their first two games and the Clippers win their first two games, that one-and-a-half game lead becomes three-and-a-half with six games to go in the resumption, and then they can throw it into cruise control. But just from a, hey, someone is chasing us, and we'd rather stay in front of them mentality, I at least think the Clippers give you a good five or six strong games in this resumption. And then let's assume Kawhi and Paul George each take at least one game off. You're talking about basically like an average number of games played. So around six and a half or seven out of the eight. I don't think that you make a large scale downgrade on Kawhi Leonard. Now, admittedly, he finished at number three on a per-game basis in 51 games so far this season. I don't think he's getting drafted at number three. Uh, By totals, he was at number six at the time the NBA shut down. You probably see him getting drafted in that Jokic-Dame range, which is usually the kind of five through eight or nine category. So probably sooner than he was drafted at the beginning of the year, Kawhi was going more in that 10 to 12 range. I think he goes maybe a slot or two earlier than that. But probably not any earlier than that, and I doubt he falls as far as he did to begin the year. Paul George is, to me, actually the more interesting case of the Clippers because he was drafted around 20 to start the year with teams assuming he would miss the first few weeks of the season and then be Paul George again. And then, as it turned out, not only did he miss those games, he missed additional games, and he wasn't really himself even when he was playing. George finished at number 30 in just 42 games played. So worse than that by totals. Still averaged 21 points, 6 boards, 4 assists, 1.3 steals. Um, this downtime could actually have been really good for Paul George. Opportunity to finally kind of get healthy, 
Uh, by the time they actually get to training camp and start playing meaningful minutes and ramping up, it'll be basically a four-month break for him. So uh, he sure as hell better be healthy. I think they'll go relatively easy on him. Like, you're probably not going to see him playing 34, 35 minutes in these games, but he'll probably look more like himself in 30 minutes. And so he's a guy I think could be an interesting little value here coming back for the resumption. Paul George, what do we think? Ends up somewhere in the teens? I could see him ending up in the teens. I could see him getting drafted later than that. Now, I should, I you know, I say teens, and I have to adjust everything I'm saying because there are going to be eight teams missing. So, you know, teens plus. Everything is, you, you just move it forward by removing the players that aren't there. I'm saying teens if this if all 30 teams were actually involved in this thing. So everything's going to move up a tiny bit. When I say someone's going to get drafted at 15, it's probably more like 13 because someone in there just isn't part of the resumption, like a Trey Young, for instance. So everybody just shifts forward one spot. Okay, we'll deal with that when we get closer and we actually get uh, some, some draft windows, some draft boards, some ADPs that we can play with. Elsewhere on the Clippers, I ain't touching Lou Williams. He might have one good game if both Paul George and Kawhi Leonard sit. I'm probably not touching Montrez Harrell because uh, he can't shoot free throws. And even though he was averaging 18 and a half and seven this year, he was killing you in a category. Now, in a points league, that changes things a little bit. But we're treating this like Roto for now. Um, I, I don't... <sighs> This, this is where it gets a little bit tougher because he finished at 101, but there were a lot of people in front of him that just, that again, are not part of the resumption. So he'll be a higher ranked guy than that now, which means he probably should be on a fantasy team. But to say, hey, here's where I would take him is kind of confusing, at least until we get a full draft board in front of us. Sorry, guys, I do a lot of research for this pod, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to go and create my own list of players now when... I can just wait a week and have one done for me. <laughs> I just, I, listen, it, it's, it wouldn't be a, uh, hard, but it would be tedious as hell to go through the top 150 and just cross out everybody that's not playing and then shift everybody up. We'll do it. We'll do it in Excel at some point when we're making our final list. But right now, we're just looking at the names of players and teams and who goes up and who goes down. And for Montrez Harrell, it's probably a sideways arrow. Whatever he was doing before, he's probably going to be doing again. He was number 101 going into the break. Some number of players in front of him are no longer playing, and so he moves inside the top 100. Therefore, he should be on a fantasy team, but he's not a guy to target necessarily. All right, let's do one more team. Let's get through three. Uh, these, are, uh, these, are, these, these are taking longer than I expected, but... It doesn't matter. There's a lot of things to talk about right now. And the Denver Nuggets are the next one on the board. And finally now, we're talking about a team that to me is relatively easy. The Nuggets want to pass the Clippers. They care, I think, more than the Clippers do about getting into that two seed. Does that mean that the Clippers will then in turn have to care a little bit more? Possibly. But it's also conceivable that the Clippers are just like, you know what, if they pass us, they pass us. They probably won't, but it's not the end of the world. Nuggets don't want to fall back, desperately don't want to fall back into the four slot because that puts them on the Lakers side of the bracket. They would love to get in front of the Clippers to get home court in each of the first two rounds because they are far better at altitude than they are away from it. And so I think they're going to play hard all eight games. Maybe somebody gets a day off, maybe the last game of the eight if it looks like the seeding is all completely locked into place. But I think you can say that with pretty much any team at this point. Therefore, I'm all for Denver Nuggets. Whatever Nuggets you can get your hands on that were actually, those guys were actually playing well before the shutdown, get them going again. Nikola Jokic playing his butt off prior to the shutdown. He was number nine by averages. He played in all 65 games. By totals, he was better than that. Uh, I, would, I would take him early. I would take him, I know this is insane to say, I would take him before Anthony Davis. Nuts, right? But by totals, if Jokic plays in all eight games and AD only plays in five, and maybe two partials and then a day off, Jokic beats him. 
in total value. It's crazy. It's completely crazy. I know. It's completely nuts. AD missed about uh, 15% of the Lakers games so far this year. And he was number two by totals. Jokic didn't miss any games. He was number three by totals. There was still a decent amount separating those two guys. But again, we're talking about every one game missed during this resumption is like 10 games missed during the regular season. Want to know the difference in games played between AD and Jokic this year? So far, 10. Exactly 10. Exactly 10 which brought them from a value separation of about 0.5, if you're looking at Basketball Monster, from 0.5 down to 0.24, meaning another game separated. If Jokic plays one additional more, meaning if Jokic gets about two games more during this resumption, two games worth of minutes, he outperforms Anthony Davis. It's nuts. It's nuts. So he needs about an extra 60 to 70 minutes. But I think right now he actually gets there. Jokic played about 32 minutes a game during a regular season. If he plays in all eight games, that gets him to around 250 minutes. If Anthony Davis plays in four, at 30, even if he's at 35 minutes a game, that's 140. Do we think he's getting to 110 over the final four if they lock it up? I don't. I think 90-something is the absolute highest. Do we think he gets to 70 games or 70 minutes fewer? Do we think he gets to 180? Maybe. A lot of risk there. It's close. Admittedly, it's close, right? Because even right now we're looking at them and we're saying AD would be around, you know, number 12-ish, number 11, number 12 if he misses two games. Jokic could potentially pass him there if he plays in all eight. If there's a two-game separation, Jokic passes Anthony Davis. If it's less than that, AD probably stays in front. So it's a a weird thing to have to think about. Would you take Jokic in front of AD? In this scenario, maybe. Elsewhere for the Nuggets, Jamal Murray. Definitely worth grabbing. He finished at 52. He'll probably play right around that mark during the resumption. Will Barton finished at 67. He'll probably be right around that mark during the resumption. Paul Millsap had an opportunity to get healthy. He, I think, should actually be a value during this resumption. And again, we talk about what they're going to be doing. I shouldn't use the rank. I, I got to get away from that crutch. I think that their actual stats will likely be the same during the resumption as they were during the regular season. I don't think I would venture to go as far as Gary Harris. But worth a look at the end of drafts because he played big minutes. And he was a top 150 guy when everybody was playing. But again, 22 out of the 30 teams are still playing, meaning 8 of the 30 teams are gone. 8 out of 30, by the way, is about 27% of the NBA. So 27% of the top 150 is 40. On average, and, you know, we don't have the exact number in front of us here, but Gary Harris would move up most likely 40 slots just because teams aren't playing. So his exact same stats coming back would make him number 113 instead of 153. Roughly. This is rough. 113 is pretty damn close to being useful. Close, I say. But if he gets hot for three or four of those games, he could easily be a top 100 guy. So, I mean, there's probably five nuggets I would put on my fantasy team coming into this resumption. I think they're going to be playing hard. I think the main, the key starters are going to be playing their 30-ish minutes a game. Paul Millsap maybe more in that uh, 20, what, 6, 27 range. But they were, outside of Millsap, generally healthy anyway after a, a stretch where almost the entire team was hurt for a little bit. Uh, to me, this is a team you should be looking at. Target Nuggets. You know what they're going to do. The stats shouldn't change much coming back here from the break. They're going to be playing hard probably for all eight of those ball games, or at least seven and change. Call it seven plus. And those are just the kind of guys you want on your team at this point. It's kind of like with the playoff league, where sometimes it actually makes more sense to take the guys who you think are just going to get all eight games. I mean, this is Nikola Jokic is a perfect example of what totals do to a player's value. Again, he was number three 
this year by totals, despite being number nine by averages. This is incredibly relevant right now because number nine, certainly not the same as number three on a per game basis. And during a long regular season, you just, there's so many things that can go right or wrong where you're like, okay, yeah, I mean, the number nine guy or the number 10 guy, who do I think is going to play more games between Jokic and Bradley Beal, blah, blah, blah. It's tough to say. Right now, you can plot this out. You know exactly what every team is playing for. And barring injuries, which might happen, COVID or otherwise, you know the motivation for these teams. It's all, it's telegraphed. We know Jokic is going to try to play in all eight of these games, as long as the team is still fighting for that number two seed. He played in all games coming into the break. He's going to probably try to play in all of them coming out of it. So even if he's number nine by averages, which, by the way, still might not be the case because Cat not playing. He was in front of him on a per-game basis. Kyrie was in front of him on a per-game basis. John Collins was in front of him on a per-game basis. If you just remove those guys, Jokic already moves up to number six by averages. Of course, it actually doesn't change where he would have finished by totals this year because he finished in front of all of those guys. But Jokic really has a chance to be uh, the number three guy by totals during this resumption. Again, he has a chance to be the number two guy by totals. Isn't that insane? If he passes Anthony Davis by totals during this resumption, to me, the only player that almost definitely finishes in front of Jokic is James Harden. Damian Lillard could finish in front of Jokic. He could be the number two guy out of the resumption. Although if they get eliminated quickly, that goes up in flames. It's crazy stuff to think about right now. But this is how things change for the resumption versus drafting for a regular season. Let's put a pin in this one. We're almost 50 minutes into the podcast. We only got through three teams. I think we'll probably move a little bit faster when you get into these clubs that are actually trying. The Lakers took longer because you had more adjustments that needed to be made. On Monday, we'll loop back around. We'll start with the Utah Jazz, the Thunder, the Rockets most likely, and then hopefully we'll get to the Mavs as well on Monday. If time, we'd get to the Memphis Grizzlies, but I have a lot to say about the Grizz, Blazers, Pels, Kings, Spurs, and Suns, and whether you should even be drafting some of the players on those teams. Uh, So those will probably take place more towards the middle of next week. Good stuff. Getting us rolling here as we prepare for the NBA to come back, we hope. 41 days and counting. This is Fantasy NBA Today. Again, DFS heads, hit me up, at Dan Vespers on Twitter. Have a lovely, safe weekend. Please be safe. Please wear a mask, actually. Please do it. So little. It's such a little thing to do, and you can do so much. Please wear a mask. Uh, Be safe. We'll talk to you guys on Monday. This is Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation. Later. This has been a Hoop Ball presentation.